This is Tommy Chong, man, and this is Wake and Bake with Captain Hooter. It's Captain Hooter. <laughs> it's happening, everybody. Hooter here. Checking in from one of my favorite apps in the Oculus Rift called Trip. Wow, how cool is this? This is the perfect setting for one of uh, one of Ian's events. I I have a great show for you today. I brought back one of our great guests from last year, Ian Bollinger. He and his partner Reggie Harris from Oakland Hyphae are the ones who put together the first psilocybin cup in Oakland last year. And then, uh-oh, oh, it looks like good things are happening here. Um, oh, wow. So they put together the psilocybin cup, the very first one. And then they did it again in the fall. And so today we have the opportunity to have Ian back to give us the update on everything that he learned from last year. Sorry, I had to get that. So he's going to update us on everything from last year and everything that's going on this year and he is fantastic once again i learned so many good things i think i'm supposed to look over here uh-oh uh-oh okay here we go ian bollinger enjoy hola hola everyone captain hooter here back season two, and I am going back in time. I'm going back, and I'm going to have a little trippy, one of those experiences, and I have the perfect guest for that. Look at that, Mr. <laughs> Ian Bollinger. Ian, sir, thank you so much for coming back. How are you? I am happy, blessed, stressed, excited. It's a new year. Um, we're opening up to a whole new range of possibilities, so I think this is going to be a a powerful conversation to start and act as a milestone or maybe even a benchmark or maybe even a, yeah. a high tide marker for oh. um, some of the spaces that we can see where, where I expect to see a lot of expansion into for the new year. So I'm excited to share oh a lot of things God. with you. Love it. Well, the last time I talked to you was in May of last year and you had just finished your spring uh, psilocybin cup. And it was the, the mm -hmm. first one of its kind at that time. And uh, you had been talking about uh, coming up into the fall cup. And that was some of the stuff we had talked about. And I have talked to you a couple of times in between and you've been kind of leaking little bits and little little trinkets of, of joy to me. You guys had one hell of an event back in September. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? I mean, it's been... I'm not going to lie, just September all the way through December has been just amazingly, like, mind-boggling. So we had our uh, Oakland Psychedelic Conference in September last year. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, um, Dennis from the Mycopreneur podcast, but um, he was our master of ceremonies that led an amazing group of, of grassroots um almost Pan-American, like we had people from Central America, we had people from uh, Indigenous America, we had people from the East Coast come out to Oakland and take part and engage in conversation around psychedelics, mushrooms, and the emerging entheogen space. And it was just amazingly beautiful. Um, my business partner, o um, Reggie, Oakland Haife, puts on these events that are not only poignant, diverse, but always hit and feel like a class reunion at the same time. It's really mm -hmm. beautiful and engaging and it's just like chef's kiss um yeah. that led into us um hyping up and getting a lot of work done around specifically our 
fall psilocybin cup, which we actually transitioned and called the hyphae cup because we wanted to expand and include cordyceps in our analysis as well. Um, and we released that data at the National Psychedelic Conference in DC, which we wow. put on in December, where we had Dr. Carl Hart come as one of our keynote speakers and had an award ceremony and gala where we presented um, and presented the the um, winners of the cup, as well as um, had an amazing engagement. Again, expanding what was done in Oakland to yeah. a more national uh, foreboard. It was beautiful. Boom. And you had one of my friends, uh, Luna Stower, I believe yeah. is one of your speakers uh, mm -hmm. in Oakland. And yep. I heard about the amazingness that was going on there. You had specifically listed as one of the the kind of uh, a, almost an attraction is you had people there that were sacred medicine stewards. This is their culture. It's not like it's a uh, an appropriated title. This is like people that actually do this work for their people and are acting as a voice box for that culture as well as that perspective. Something that's mm -hmm. Very rarely heard of and very often tokenized mm -hmm. in a lot of situations that we did our best to provide them everything that they would have asked for. So as to make sure it's not us being like, hey, come up here and do this thing in front of this audience. Like, no, who do you want to talk to? How can we make sure those people are coming here? And how can we make sure your voice gets amplified in a way? We'll step off to the side and let you do all the talking because this is your space wow. to say what you want. It's not like, we want you to give this agenda for us. It's like, no, if you wanna be critical of us and the work we do, we will give you a stage for that because that's as important as anything else. And I think that's something that makes, again, Oakland Hyphe events completely different than other events is the ability to be reflexive and reflective. So we'll listen to and react like reflexes to what people are saying in our community, as well as reflect on those things as well to see how we can do better for ourselves mm -hmm. and our communities. And yeah. again, yeah, shout Jim. out Luna. Luna is an amazing human being who I'm blessed to call friend. Um, yeah. Her voice and her perspective on a lot of the different trials and tribulations of the cannabis industry, as well as the strengths of the people that work in it um, mm -hmm. or, or are supplementary to it. Like we're in this space because we have a passion. Um, yeah. And that's the community that we need to make sure. I know last time I was on here, I spoke of like the question, where's the cannabis community? It, it exists in us and we mm -hmm. are really the things holding it together. And as long as we don't lose sight of that, the industry that may be built on top of our shoulders, um, it's not going to last forever. The community will. And that's why I appreciate right. your recognition of the sacred medicine workers. And because those are the people that are the community that held that space during prohibition, during um, colonization, all of these different ideas that we could talk about. Those are the people, the community of people that held firm and kept these traditions around. And this is why they're a key component of what um, our message is going to always try to represent. If that makes sense. Kind of. I, yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to remember because there's that something that Luna talks about um, uh, culture keepers. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. it? Culture that keepers. That is it. That that was it. It's a, it, caring and keeping that knowledge and passing it on and 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 learning from the whole experience. In our first uh, uh, um, interview, uh, I my level of knowledge went from about here to about here. Um, just in, I, in, and the amount of time I had to spend when we were through just re-researching and looking and going tryptamines. Now, wait a second. How, do I, no, 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 no. The, we're, I must be, you know, I had to spend a lot of time to actually kind of catch up to get to the point where I, I was understanding everything that actually took place here. Um, no, I'm glad I could inspire that that, that, that foray. No, no, and thank you, thank you so much. And and now though, I almost feel like I it's it's like almost I don't want to say it's a bad thing, but now I'm hungry for more, and mm, and mm. and things are changing though. They're changing mm -hmm. at a pretty quick pace. And Very. Um, you 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 had made a we made the mention of the 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 mention of the kind of the crossover of of, of the high times cup, and yeah. judging a cannabis cup versus a psilocybin cup. 
And mm. I know that there were some people that actually had, had talked to you about this and you set out a very specific path to make sure you didn't go down that path, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think the there's a lot of different things. I, like I think I had mentioned on our previous conversation, there's a lot of pitfalls that the cannabis industry has fallen into that it would benefit us as a community to recognize, or hell, let's talk about it this way, as o Oakland people might understand this. Um, potholes are a thing that affect the community. If we, if we don't work together to resolve those issues in our roads, we're the ones, our politicians aren't gonna be riding on these roads. They're not out here every day in their cars, but it's gonna affect us. So as community, it's on us to fix our roads in this kind of a way, I feel. And so one of the things that I knew the uh, cannabis industry did was it brought a lot of subjective opinions to things. And I don't think subjective opinions are bad or wrong. I just don't know if it's beneficial for us to try to build lasting structures of, of, of judgment or even not even judgment of analysis on strictly subjective uh, spaces or ideas. And so one of the things that we tried to do um, differently from the High Times Cannabis Cup on top of not just saying high number, uh, I mean, uh, this is the only champion first, second, third place, we kind of flip that hierarchy horizontal. Um, but we also tried to establish the fact that honestly, I believe that um, there's a deeper conversation to have around um, uh, not just objective, but subjective testing. So utilizing um, data as a space to talk about how we represent um, champions, not just specifically, oh, this smells great. It makes me feel this way. It's like, we couldn't right. necessarily do that kind of a thing with mushrooms. Like it would take right. us a year to test uh, uh, 50 different types of mushrooms because we'd want to give ourselves breaks in between and we'd have to consume an amount to not only have an effect, but then we also have to look at stacking effects. So the likelihood of us being able to subjectively judge all of these mushrooms was very, very unlikely. So we went with something a little bit more objective, i.e. Um, chromatographic analysis or, or chemical analysis of these compounds. And again, not trying to do a first, second, third pace big number equals good, flipping the conversation from vertical to horizontal was the conversation piece that I brought up last time. But this time, I think it's important to note what data we're looking at and why we're looking at it. So okay. even from spring last year to fall, we made a transition ourselves because spring, mm -hmm. as you and I have had a conversation about before, um, the numbers that I was representing in spring were representative of, of all the tryptamines present, even whether or not they had an effect on the psychedelic experience or not. I was accounting for all of those in my championship numbers. And after having conversations and having research come out, I think it was November last year is when a paper came out that really changed my perspective on the whole process mm -hmm. of looking at this, which is one of the reasons why the data was released in December was because I wanted to make sure I included this new understanding in the data. It's, it's necessary as part of the growth process to say, this is where I was. And those were the mistakes that this was, an, this was a mistake that I agree I made. This is where we are now. And this is but, how but we've learned from just, that mistake. Just so that you, you know, because you're being a little overly cruel on yourself. You're <laughs> way ahead of everyone else. Just again, going back to May of last year, when you were talking about six different tryptamines, and you know, I think we were talking about uh, psilocin, psilocybin, uh, bay of cystin, nor bay of cystin, and, and that was the only four, though, that you could find anywhere else in the world. You were, you were already way ahead of us with uh, um, uh, originicin. Originicin. Originacin. Okay. Eruginacin. Yeah, it's a weird one. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, okay. <laughs> Sounds like and, an Elvish uh, word, to uh, be honest. And <laughs> if you take enough of them, you'll start to say it like Elvis did. But you were still way ahead of everyone else uh and now you're even you're 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 so far ahead that you're able to now rein yourself back in a little bit and 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 be a little bit uh more specific well we're hoping to um make sure the data we're providing is helpful to the people because the whole purpose of all of this is harm reduction like if i'm not helping people understand the medicines that they're going to be taking or the sacraments that they're, they're going to be taking whatever framework they choose to look at it under 
um, the teachers, the mushrooms, whatever. Um, I, I don't think that the data is helpful. And so my goal is always to provide something that is going to help a person to know whether or not they're going to be going deep or whether they're going to be getting in the kiddie pool, you know, because that's helpful. Like if you're going to get in the kiddie pool or you're expecting to get in the kiddie pool and all of a sudden you're neck deep, those are two different um, places, depending, especially when we're talking about not just mentally neck deep, but where you're at physically. Like, I don't want you to be driving a car and then all of a sudden realize that wasn't a microdose. You know, that's the last, that's the worst case scenario. So again, everything that I'm trying to do, it's, it's a growth process. And this is something that um, thankfully the community is open to. Um, if this was a pharmaceutical company, um, which would be typically the space in which these conversations would be occurring. This would all be behind closed doors. Nobody would hear anything about it. Maybe a handful of people would be looking at the data and making decisions based off of that data. Um, I'm thankful for the fact that the community is not just clamoring to understand, but also willing to grow our understanding together. Because again, like, yeah, I'm at the bleeding edge of this in a lot of ways. And that's a very dangerous place to be. It's not just the cutting edge, it's the bleeding edge. If you don't pay attention, it, it can be very detrimental. So making so, sure that so, at, at this point, I'm doing the right work. Let me, let me ask you then, based on, on, on what you've learned, if we were to take the spring uh, competition, and how many samples did you have in the spring competition? Oh, about just, I think it was about 120-ish. I think it's what it was. I think just under 120, maybe over between 100 and 120, I would say. Okay. And how many did you have in the fall? We had about 72 in the fall. So and that's and that's not including the stuff that we do off season as well as far as testings. Right. But I mean, if we're going, you know, just strictly off of cup numbers, um, I'm in the 300s as far as cup numbers. OK. And if you, you what what was the biggest difference between the fall entries and the spring entries that you saw? the diversity of organisms that we tested. So typically we only tested um, Psilocybe cubensis varieties. Like people would get a spore print offline, they would go out into the wild, collect a, a mushroom from a cow patty, grow it themselves, or they would get a liquid culture from some Etsy store. You know, that's typically what we would see. We would see hillbillies, we would see uh, penis envies galore, which sounds hilarious when I say it that way. Um, <laughs> uh, we would see stargazers, Jedi mindfucks, Melmex, yeah. all of these different species, all of which are essentially varieties of Psilocybe cubensis. Um, the, the most impressive difference that we saw between all of our previous uh, cups and this most recent cup in the fall was the unique species that came in. We had Paniolus bisporus, Psilocybe alenii, we had some very interesting um, species come in as outliers for all intents and purposes. We're seeing people cultivating non-cubensis, like the Paniolus bisporus, um, the uh, Psilocybe gallandoi, Alenii, these are wood lovers. These are not grown on manure substrates. They, they prefer to grow on wood chips. And that comes with them fully different, unique profiles. Like their chemistry profiles are very, very different. Where typically you would see um, a ridiculous, uh, ridiculously high ratio of psilocybin to other compounds. So it's like your psilocybin to baocystin per, um, ratio would typically be like 62 to 1 you know, really high. When we looked at these other species, we actually saw um, ratio profiles that were actually a little bit more, more reasonably close to each other. Um, even so much as to say, we even saw, I, I believe it was a, uh, the Paniolus bisporus. I'll have to double check the data, but one sample actually had a nigh onto one to one psilocybin to psilocin ratio, which is very, very rare. Like I don't see that often at all, which is actually something to be sought after to some degree by some folks um, looking to consume fresh mushrooms um, because psilocin is definitely one of those compounds that hits you faster 
it will like your body doesn't need to digest it it will as soon as it hits your blood it will go to your brain cross the blood brain barrier and have an effect um, versus psilocybin which needs to be digested or these other compounds which may not even cross the blood brain barrier origination yeah. uh, baocystin and their hydroxy metabolites um, uh, those compounds tend to not uh, across the blood brain barrier as much. And so there's a conversation to have around that as to whether or not. New, and that's new information, right? Um, you know? Like I said, um, a lot of the work pointed towards it. It's being reaffirmed. I wouldn't say it's new. Like Bayocystin was given to mice intravenously. I think it was in like the 90s. And if you give psilocybin to mice intravenously, they're going to have like the head twitch effect and actually have other telltale signs of a psychedelic experience. Um, doing so with Bayocystin does not do that. And I think even Paul Stamets was on Joe Rogan saying that he took Bayocystin by itself in a pure form and he didn't feel a psychedelic effect, but he did feel a boost in mood. So there's a conversation to be had about the roles these things have in these other peripheral serotonin receptor binding kind of, you know, we have the second gut, we have our heart, which is very full of serotonin receptors, as well as our body, our skeletal muscle system, which contains these things. So how these compounds bind to these other serotonin receptors is important. And again, a recent paper in November came out that did a lot of this looking at that um, and provided a lot of information that informed the fall tests to where I'm only classifying those compounds when I'm looking at dosage recommendations that are known to have a psychedelic effect. So if I was testing a, uh, a, a Bufo frog sample, I would list out all the 5-MeO, the NNDMT, all of these other compounds that I would be seeing there. Um, and I would be listing those out as those would likely, when you smoked it, would have an effect on you. But if you have just tryptamine in there and you, and you vaporize that, that's not going to have a psychedelic effect. But it's likely going to be there because it's a building block of DMT and 5-MeO DMT or, or even um, a bufotenin, which is 5-hydroxy uh, DMT. So if I'm seeing any of those compounds, I'm adding them all together and I'm saying this is the known psychedelic compound uh, concentration and use that to inform dosing versus before where I was utilizing all of the tryptamines and saying this is part of what causes the effect. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no. Cool. I, and, and actually, I'm going to be putting up uh, your chart, which you sent oh. me a chart about understanding tables and charts about uh, uh, this exact, about talking about the compounds and the value. And I think that that's very helpful. In I hope. I hope. Like, again, I, I'm down for feedback. So anybody that's listening that wants to leave comments, I'm here to listen. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, uh, uh, out of the fall, out of the fall session, uh, did you see any superstars? Did any did any stars rise up? Did you see any new side products or side um, derivatives that might become uh, big products that you'll see going out to the masses someday? So there's at least three questions there, and I'll try to approach yeah. them as you <laughs> said them. So okay. any any people like rising stars, right? Um, yeah. Any uh, interesting products, and I'm gonna also um, add into there um, not just rising stars but um, reigning champions. I would also uh, add to the list if that's okay. Yes, yeah. Okay, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, um, there's a group um, out, out of the East Coast called Big Psych, um, which were the group that submitted the woodlovers, the exotics. Like their whole goal is to show to the world that it's not just Psilocybe cubensis, that there's a bunch of different exotics out there that are worth looking at. Like, um, interestingly enough, you know, when we look at cannabis, the only living relatives to cannabis outside of, you know, what we call cannabis indica, cannabis sativa is hops. But it's like the only living plant relative to it, um, which is a very limited genetic pool if you think about things. So when we look at mushrooms or specifically psilocybin producing mushrooms, they're a wildly diverse group. Furthermore, psilocybin production is theorized to have arisen separately in different places within the mushroom kingdom. So there's some 
weirdness to this that we still haven't figured out in science. Like there are theories that say that that there's a fitness to having this protection and thus being in an environment and developing it was needed. But again, there's whole questions evolutionarily that we still don't understand around that. Regardless, the idea that Big Psych is trying to do is trying to highlight non-Cubensis, the exotics. And so they're definitely the group that I would recommend people uh, keep an ear to the ground for, if that makes sense. Um, are, they, they're, are they actually selling to the public? Is that something you can purchase? Nope, they do not actually sell um, the fruits. Um, maybe they sell the, the genetics, I'm not sure. And um, the goal is to provide people, again, I think they donate everything. I'm not sure specifically the approach. I just know that they're cultivators of culture, as we had talked about before, culture keepers. Um, like if you talk, so you know that vibe that you get, I know this is gonna be kind of niche and just like a you and me thing, but you know that vibe that you get when you talk to Luna, you know, that presence that she has of being present, you know, and, and actually engaging with you as you are, the heart is working in a way that, that other people's hearts might not even know how to work. You know, it's like, it's like, and that's what I, I, I believe this group um, is definitely doing. And they're, they're heart first, like their goal is not to, create a um a billion dollar product their goal is to create a um a community that has their needs met beautiful so okay and then yeah. reigning champions um silly simon um he has submitted twice um fruits that are that just blow out the charts blow everything out of the water even these exotics um, and I think it has a lot to do with, um, the way in which he cultures and the way in which, um, he not just utilizes substrate, but also his genetics. Like he's been working with a specific genetic lineage for a while. His Shiva lingams were the second most potent mushroom I tested in the first fall cup. And now they're the, the most potent mushroom I've tested, um, out of all the fall cups. So, um, whatever work he's doing is consistent it's potent and it deserves a lot of support like i mean as soon as the data came out for whatever it is um uh i i sent them the i, I sent them the text whatever you're doing just keep doing it because it, it blew my mind and then they hit me back later and he's like yeah i was just working with a person in hospice helping them you know get a new a, a new perspective on their where they're at in their life and i was just like whoa that's like yeah that's community right there like showing up and, and 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 that's what i'm saying is like the universe works in weird ways we are the community building itself you know it's like this is this is the strength you know well and i think we started to talk a little bit about this about uh you know big uh, uh big industry big business and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know that with all of the states legalizing right now, it's been, you know, a phenomenal uh, year last year as far as uh, how many people and, and, and yep. this year looks like it's going to be exactly the same. Um, yep. I think that's 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 happening internationally, but but it's interesting. In the United States. It's um, definitely in the definitely. United States and Canada, yeah. Canada, too. Yeah, exactly. Have have has there been a lot of big business knocking on the door and and uh, you know how how do you go about this? I mean, we know it's a good thing. Is it a good thing? So you know? those the, the is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It's a hard answer question to answer because it it's what's. I mean, what's good for one person might not be good for another. What's good for a community might be harmful for another. What's good for a person might be harmful to a community. Um, and so understanding good and bad is always an, an understanding of perspective. Sorrowfully, the only way we can really answer that is to do and reflect, like to find out what happens. And honestly, we are very patient, like, yes, um, there are people that want to reach out to and work with um, 
a lot of the the groups that we're in but then there are others that wouldn't touch us with a 10-foot pole so th there are give and take to things um uh, my business partner who is arguably one of the most influential events organizers in the psychedelic space period um is not even thought of as a, an invite to the conversation at places like Canadelic Miami or um, it, 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 I'm not going to go into another one because there's conversations being had, but I'm saying it's like there's spaces to where it's like there are people out here that are doing um, a lot of the work. Like I say, like, like my business partner has run two Oakland psychedelic conferences, a California psychedelic conference and a national psychedelic conference in three different cities does um, conferences in Denver and in Oregon and doesn't even get an invite or hear anything from um, or any support from a large corporadelic style event. It's very telling. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's a there's a very strong narrative there. Where it's like when there was a uh, 50 top 50 people um, in uh, the psychedelic business space, his name wasn't even mentioned once. But then there was another gentleman on there who's literally run three psychedelic businesses into the ground, who's on that list. So it's just like there's this weird um, kind of space where it's like. There's a reason why there's a group I work with called a table of our own. Um, they have a, if you haven't seen uh, the trailer for their documentary, it's a, a table of our own doc. Um, I think doc um, dot com, And I think it's on YouTube, but um, the reason why I work with this group is because I recognize the fact that there is some level of corporate delicate gatekeeping or glass ceiling where people get invited to like a diversity, equity, and inclusion panel, but not a psychedelics business panel when people are running these businesses. It's like, it's like you, you're, it's like versus these other people that are like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm running a, 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 you know, B Corp out of Montreal and we're, you know, developing new, uh, psilocybin like drugs it's like okay cool that's you should have that person sat next to the person that is doing this other work and have like the, the, the not not have them in two separate locations and have it be like oh well this is the one this is going to be like the the conversation that we're having on this day versus the last day which is i think micopreneur dennis had the best satire for it um where he kind of mocked um the last day of the most recent big event that he was invited to as press, um, where he's like the last day was basically diversity, equity, inclusion day. Um, but the irony is, is one of the groups that was uh, on that panel, one of their employees watched Dennis's satire, thought it was 100% accurate, thought it was so accurate that they posted it themselves on like reposted it on their IG and then lost their job because of it. So it's like this weird corporate, you see what I'm saying? It's like, so I, I'm trying to, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Like, it's like, as yeah. soon as, as soon as people latch on to these larger things, there's always strings attached. There's always, oh, well this, this advertiser or this funder didn't like the way that this came out or doesn't like the fact that you're doing this thing. We're going to ask you to step away. It's like, this is not the this is not a community at this point if we can't look at ourselves at the sacred clown that you would invited into the space the satire that that's being presented in the mirror you're having reflected upon yourself then 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 these mushrooms then you're not obviously doing these mushrooms because that's the let's be open to the possibility that we need to reflect and grow like let's i think that's one of the more important lessons i've learned from working with these teachers so i think that being cautious about bringing in corporate money is i we're slow slow rolling it like reggie and i are the only owners of our company like yeah maybe we'll um, build it to the point to where the value is so so great that we don't want to um even try to fight off all the people throwing offers at us anymore but until that point comes like 
we're keeping it real. Like we're keeping it, we're doing the work ourselves. Like we're making sure that we work with the people that we want to work with. We're building the contracts with the people we want to build the contracts with. We're actually giving people the data that want the data, not just here's yeah, my fruit, give me my number. Yeah, there you go. And you're actually sharing and you're building the rest of the community to come up and stay with you so that you're moving all together. Uh, in the world. That's, that's one of the big, uh, you know, the big tells for me. And I mean, it was very apparent, you know, with you guys from the very beginning. I'm going to take you back to one of the questions that I asked before because we covered uh, stars. Yep. Did you see any new um, distribution system, any new products? Um, you know, uh, I'm seeing lots of people with uh, uh, obviously chocolate bars is kind of like the number one thing that you see now with these especially for micro doses. Did you see anything new, innovative, uh, anything, uh, uh, you know? Not in the cup. That? We don't want to take those in the cup right now just because we only do research and development testing for those kinds of things. Because, I mean, the issue is, is like, I, I can't treat a powdered extract the same as I can treat a stabilized extract if that makes sense. So if you give me psilis, like your mushroom powder that you just did an ethanol extract on and you reduced it all down to a powder and you gave that to me, that's a different product than somebody that took that powder and then stabilized it with something, like used something to make it shelf just, stable. Just strictly the mushroom drop. Right now that I've seen a lot of cultivation stuff, not necessarily like after product stuff, a lot of the space right now is getting people to grow stuff on their own. So like grow boxes and things like that are typically what I've seen a lot of these days. Um, typically advertising oyster mushrooms, but I know for a fact that's not what you you would grow in those things most right. of the time. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, some people might. Just strictly the mushroom dried and ground down to a powder. Have I seen new vectors for that? I have in the sense of there are people that are actively trying to do um, this uh, sodas or teas is a new thing that people are trying to do. So they have like caps that they have stuff in. So I don't, I've seen these for cannabis where they actually have like the fat soluble stuff in a cap and then they release that. Um, there's work being done in those spaces um, specifically for um, teas is my understanding to make uh, allow you to make like a, a mushroom tea, but I don't know of anything outside of those kind of like teas and tea bags that are strictly mushrooms, but I have seen people doing like ridiculous like, like I've seen some pretty ridiculous things I've seen gourmet truffles like um, are you familiar with um, the uh, cannabis dining events called High End Affair? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Chef Nikki um, was also at the DC conference and enlightened me as, as to some of their R&D work um, that they're engaging with, with um, some of these mushrooms. So if you're interested in understanding different vectors and things like that, um, Chef Nikki is definitely a person I would tell you to reach out to. Um, genius. Uh, I, I mean, I'm got from Ohio State. Um, I got their culinary degree and has been literally stretching the meaning of what it means to be a chef to amazing way and into a beautiful, like beautiful um, new space. So again, if if you wanted to ask those questions, I have answers. But I'm kid you not, Chef Nikki's answer is going to be way better than mine. Ian, what about education? So, but yeah, no, education is huge. Like, um, I since we started the Patreon, that's one of the biggest things that I've been trying to. Like, we do the scientific paper discussions. Um, we are trying to bring in people. Uh, our next podcast is with a gentleman from Mexico who's working, who worked to get cannabis rights in Mexico as a as a citizen's right, an amparo, like a, a an injunction, basically saying the government can't deter you from being able to smoke cannabis. Um, right. They they're now going to try to do that for mushrooms. Um, and so we had him on a podcast uh, for our Patreon. We're calling it the Indigo Research Hour. Um, my friend Emily and I, we're going to be doing that once a month. And it's going to be, we're trying to bring some interesting conversations to the forefront. But also on the Patreon, we're also doing scientific paper discussions. And then furthermore, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is this summer, we're going to be trying to offer a mushroom extraction course. 
Um, it's going to try to be a three day event that we're going to be offering in Oakland. Um, it's going to be a total of three day in person, but it's a total of uh, five total courses that we're going to be um, uh, five days worth of, of coursework that we're going to engage with students. And our goal is to teach the next generation of people. So just like how um, cannabis labs need people that know how to do cannabis testing. Definitely. We know that the, we were going to do our best to help provide the skill sets for the next generation of mushroom testers is our goal is to provide the education. Um, initially, this is going to be meant for people that maybe have uh, a, a mushroom background or maybe a degree or biology or chemistry. And then once we've ironed it out, we're going to try to make it then to somebody that maybe just graduated high school. And then once we've done that well enough, our goal is to then expand it out to anybody English isn't even your first language. You didn't even get a, an American style education. We could still teach you how to do this, you know? And that's the key what, to all of this. And that's what we're going for. So like, like our initial goal is just make sure we can teach it to people that are gonna probably be doing this in labs. Then teach it to people that are gonna wanna learn how to do it so they can get into those labs. Then teach it to the people that just wanna learn how to do it. You know, it's like, that's how we can try to expand and grow it. So we're going to be, um, if you're interested in saying touch, I'll give you some more information about that as, as we iron it out. It's still in its very deep uh, planning stages, but all the gears seem to be working to make it happen. And it's going to be a summer course we're going to be offering in Oakland this year. So I'll keep you posted about it. But three different, I believe it's going to be, uh, let me double check the dates that we had friends. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, uh, April, May, and June or when we're gonna be doing it mid-April, mid-May mid, mid and mid-June. It's when we're gonna be planning on doing it um, on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday kind of a thing uh, for the in-person coursework. And we're gonna get people like hands-on, like working with cordyceps, like how you go from like a cordyceps fruit to a homogenized fruit to what kind of extractions you can do. And then look at that data and compare all of that data together and understand why it is we're looking at this data like you tell us what you see kind of a thing like trying to create a space of of peer education um and that's kind of what we're hoping to build both um here in oakland and then hopefully going to expand it out from there well I, I i can tell you every time we have a conversation i feel like i'm i'm getting a, a small master class and uh i i thank you again so much for coming in uh, and uh 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 giving uh, my listeners and uh, my viewers uh, an update so that they can keep themselves uh, up here and aware of what's going on. You know, I, I have viewers that are all around the world, but I'm here in the Netherlands, which is really an interesting thing because we're going back in time still here. You mm -hmm. know, uh, magic mushrooms are not legal here. You can grow your own, um, mm -hmm. but you're, you're uh, eating um uh, uh what are the 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 um they yeah, the sclerosia like, the truffles if you will the yeah, truffles yeah. yes uh, truffles yeah. exactly and uh you know so i i i i feel uh honored just to be able to see all of your goodies and one other thing i was going to ask you now i know i have a website um that is already up for uh that showed me all of the entrance and the final results for the spring cup is there mm -hmm. one posted now for the fall cup is that, I believe uh, that was the thing I shot you okay, um, in okay. this chat, in this chat. Okay, okay, fantastic. So I'll be able to, add, I wanna make sure that that uh, everybody gets a chance to see those. Uh, also, I noticed uh, in both of the cases, should we have some sort of uh, envy of penis envy? <laughs> As it stands, I mean, it depends. Like it's, so are you envious of your teacher? Oh. There you go. Um, I think that I mean the names that we use for these are, I think, going to change over time, um, yes. I, and I think that that's. I I don't know if it's going to stay that way. I don't care if it stays that way or not. Honestly, it doesn't offend me. Honestly, there should be more questions about the conversation of what penis envy is. You know, like, like this is this is. I think that I think having that conversation is a better conversation piece than changing it in some ways, because it asks us, okay, well, where did it come from? Well, it comes from Sigmund Freud, 
who was Sigmund Freud? Well, Sigmund Freud was the father of modern psychology, even though nobody ever, uh, nobody believes anything that he said holds true. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but so there's this whole like, and then you can just be like, it just looks like a phallus. Like there are some, there are some fucking, some of the most ridiculous pictures I've ever seen are of literally some of the most like phallic looking mushrooms. Like if I didn't know any better, like if I didn't see like the stump at the bottom, I would be like, wait a minute. Wow. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can definitely see a time and a place where, you know, just like in the cannabis industry where we have Snoop Dogg, Callie Cush, you know, someday we're going to be, you know, we'll be looking at, you know, uh, uh, Ian Bollinger's uh, uh, blonde bananas. I would fight against that. So as a scientist, one of the, one of the, um, biggest faux pas of science is to name an organism after yourself uh oh <laughs> okay it's one of the biggest faux pas like you're supposed to name okay. it after somebody else or something else um okay. and so i would argue that i'm looking forward to the day where we have lineage trace maps so it's like you can get your dog uh, it's DNA 23 and me, or, you know, it's not 23 and me, but you know what I'm saying? You know, you can get the, the genetic history for the lineage, if you will. I think that's the space that we're going to get into is we're going to end up looking at, um, species lineages. And I think that it's going to be a little bit more personalized. I'm actually of the mindset that if you have Central American heritage, you should probably take mushrooms from Central America. If you have Moroccan heritage, you should take mushrooms from Morocco. If you're of Norwegian heritage, you should take, and this is just my idea. I'm not saying you you okay. should as in like you have a moral obligation no, I like to. It. I think it's okay. maybe more of an ought, like what's well, also still of an obligation. But it's like, I think that that's the space that we should talk about. Like if you're, if you have an Australian um, heritage, like an Aboriginal heritage, are there, um, uh, like actual Aboriginal mushrooms or are there only ones that were brought over with the colonists? You know, it's like, and what, what are the things you native tie, to your- Tied mushrooms to an Australian guy, okay. I mean, well, these are questions that we don't understand. I'm arguing, what I'm saying is like, this is a step towards personalized medicine is what I'm saying. It's like, there's okay. a reason why um, certain um, people have certain diets it's because they've been eating those so long their microbiomes are adjusted to those things and it's like that utilizing those things is part of their diet so i think that like i can't eat ludovisc i'm sorry it's just not my thing like it's yeah. just it's, it's it's each their own you know it's like as far as like dishes like rotten or fermented fish is just uh, i'm a fresh fish guy not a not a fermented yeah. fish guy um yeah. And so I think that this is going to be a unique medicine to unique people. Like they're going to be unique tastes. So just like how my nose knows, your nose knows when you're smelling weed, it's like, yeah, I want this one more than I want this one. You know, it's like, it's yeah, not necessarily. I, I, don't, I don't feel like we're reaching, we're reaching our potential, our proper potential for, for the okay. really great names that we can, we, you know, you can see all the crazy shit that they've already come up with in the cannabis. I, I think we need to call it Silly Simon and, say listen you know you're you're up here you're you're you've got the, the <laughs> well i think he's done that with his shiva lingam like his uh the the that's his i think that's a unique name to him like i don't think anybody else grows that name and that in and of itself exactly. that's shiva's dick is what it yeah, is okay, like so that's what lingam <laughs> is is it's dick so again oh, are we are we it. just yeah you see what i'm saying like so i think he is pushing that envelope that you're asking for <laughs> okay Fantastic. That's the guy we're looking for, though. I love it. Uh, any when's it, when's the next show? Is a spring show coming up next? Um, our next uh, call, uh, sorry, our next competition is going to be in spring. We're going to start putting advertisements out that here mid February, um, and then furthermore, we're going to be doing the um, California Psychedelic Conference. I think it's in Long Beach is where Reggie's planning on doing it this year. Um, I have to double check that. Um, and that's likely where we're going to announce the winners of the spring, um, the spring cup. Furthermore, um, we're looking to 
we're looking to invite and create a space of, like I said, so we're going to have this educational course and we currently have our method dual validated in multiple labs. Our goal is to try to, anybody can go out and do testing right now. Our goal is to again, create a space where people can look at a standard of what testing could be and trying to okay. set, set that standard and try to be that standard as the best that we can. Um, yeah. That being said, I know um, there's interest internationally to have a lot of these conversations. And I've already spoken to Reggie. That's like, I mean, what's the next step? You go Oakland Psychedelic Conference, California Psychedelic Conference, National Psychedelic Conference, International Psychedelic National. Conference. There you go. Yep. I mean, so at this point, I think that there's space. Um, I, know I have a friend. Are you familiar with the amazing um, Wonderkind? Um, William Padilla Brown. Yeah. Look yeah, him up. Um, uh, definitely one of those oh, people. Talking, one, amazing Wonderkin Brown. Uh, uh, that's just my that's just my title for him. Uh, he's okay. Reggie calls him the young genius. Um, okay. But uh, William, and then okay. his last name is hyphenated Padilla P A D I L L A hyphen Brown. Um, amazing human being. Um, busy as fuck. Um, literally wrote the book on cordyceps cultivation and then revised it when new information came out to make it more accurate um amazing human being does a bunch of different things runs his own company um is a father of two just a crazy crazy kid that's just doing amazing things um he's in the east coast in pennsylvania of the united states but he does have connections internationally um he actually said that there's a uh cannabis club in um barcelona that would be maybe interested in doing an event with us this year so maybe we can touch sure. base with you about that see if we can't put something yeah. together because it's like an art and cannabis club is what it is oh, i think i know exactly where it is i'm, I'm heading there next month i'll be there for spanibus so i'm going to cover uh, spanibus for uh, fat nugs magazine and nice uh, I, i'm very familiar uh, with i think that particular club because there's only okay one or two that are uh, cannabis art galleries and do the whole thing. That's actually a, a great choice. And Barcelona is a great choice in general. That's what I hear. Got the law so much different and you know ahead of the times as opposed to my great grandmother's home here in Amsterdam where we're truffling it. <laughs> well, again, we want, to, um, we want to provide space for an education. So if there's space to grow our education in a way that's powerful, I mean, I work in Mexico as well. So um, trying to bring in a lot of the Spanish speaking side of things is gonna be necessary to expand because historically a lot of these organisms come from Central America, South America, where having this educational work is gonna be beneficial to have it in another language besides English. So a lot of the groups I'm working with are, are trying to weave this conversation together. I've never heard about any kind of mushrooms from the Far East. Is that another one of the areas that uh, is? I am to... deeply interested in this conversation. Um, up until the early 2000s, um, uh, Japan had no laws around psychedelic mushrooms. And there are numerous indigenous psychedelic species um if i recall correctly it's like um shadow numbing mushroom is the translation of the name um and that's a it's a very interesting uh look recently there are laws that they've passed i think that that restrict cultivation and um and use and sale but i do believe that there are still naturally occurring um psilocybe native to japan that are woefully under investigated. Um, and those actually are likely from uh, a mainland China descent, but we would need to do some more genetics work to be able to answer that question. And it's something that I'm deeply interested in trying to answer. Okay, road trip. I'm, I'm, that's one of the things I'm working with my nonprofit, the Entheome, Entheogen Genome Foundation to do. Um, we went to Mexico and did a whole research station in the cloud forests of Oaxaca. Um, I think we're, and it, it, it worked in some ways and it didn't work in others. It was a learning experience. Um, 
And I look forward to improving that and trying to take that out to, you know, research stations in Japan, in rural Japan, where we can go and set up and do Starlink and run off of solar generators. You know, it's like, that would be fun and interesting to do. And so that's something that I'm working together with to try to create the conversation space around. Yeah, yeah. And in a way where you can do it, where you can be protected well enough that everybody can be comfortable doing it. Yeah, in Mexico, it's a lot, um, it's a lot uh, has its different um, needs versus Japan, definitely. Like, I'm yeah. not as concerned about safety in Japan as I am in, in uh, some parts of Mexico. Yeah. Um, in Japan, if we're doing it with the blessing of a university to do research, yeah. which is likely the, or we're, we adhere to Nagoya Protocol at the Entheome Foundation. And so our goal is to um, make sure that we respect and recognize the indigeneity of these organisms. So our goal is strictly to research. Like our goal isn't to go out and collect and distribute the genetics to, no, it's like we wanna find the ecosystems in which these things occur, look at all the different mushrooms that occur out there so we can catalog the ecosystem, and then say, this is the geolocation, this rural town is a geolocation of this indigenous powerful mushroom in, in Japan. This town is dying. It needs support. Here is a way you can support that town to help provide a protection of this ecosystem, or you know, stuff like that. That's the goal of the Entheum Foundation: is to boost that's, that's signal of these organisms and their ecosystems. And so, I think yeah. that's the space where we would want the blessing of the the governments in which we're working under. Um, we are directly doing our best to do that and work with not just the governments, but also indigenous people that maybe have been utilizing those things as a part of their practice. Like there are some towns in Mexico where literally they have been, have an unbroken line of, of mushroom use. You know, some Zapotec families are able to trace that back. That's no fucking joke. Mm -hmm. I think that's so. the, that might be one of the next uh, uh, exploration trips is going to be uh, through Jamaica. Uh, Ooh, yeah. I, you know that that they've done a couple of conferences over the last uh, few years, and uh, one of uh, one of my good friends is uh, involved. A couple of my good friends are involved in that industry there in Jamaica, and I I have a dream that I can see one day all of the old people that used to play golf will all give up that game. And all those golf courses will become beautiful little magic mushroom walking uh, courses where you can just start walking along this course. All kinds of good stuff that you could do there. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, I, I would hope for that too. I, that's very much a pipe dream. But it's also the issue I think we faced earlier when I was bringing up um, the people that are are not holding space for the sacred clown or the satire. It's like the rich people aren't necessarily taking the mushrooms, yeah. you know. That's the hardest part. Well, I think that you are seeing a uh, an, a larger infusion of older and uh, economically uh, more well suited types of participants with the emergence of a quote unquote microdose uh, uh, movement, which is sure. kind of what, but I because that's what I'm hearing about all the time is is about different forms of microdosing and and so i think that that if there is going to be a bridge or something of that nature you're going to see it uh coming through the microdose and then bridging into uh larger experiences uh from that yeah absolutely uh, i i think that this is definitely the gateway i guess towards that um i do think that there's a weird space around that though like I'm apprehensive because the people, the older generation would only trust a microdose from a pharmaceutical company for the most part. Like the people, those are the people that, um, that's the space that I worry about is the pharmaceutical space because the pharmaceutical space always, always, always chokes out the smaller uh, medicine worker. Yeah. And that, and that is that is yet to be disproven in my experience. I'm open to the possibility that it could be disproven, but I don't believe that that's the space that we sh that's the default space we should uh, shoot for. And while I, I I love the idea, 
again, there's 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 a lot of landmines on this path forward that if we're not attentive to, or at least having in our uh, part of the conversation, I think it's a uh, it's dangerous and helpful. You know, it's like it's dangerous if we ignore it. It's helpful if we talk about it. Um, and so I think that this is why I think it's important for us to have conversations like this and I have, have space for it's like, yeah, I want people to be uh, exposed to the possibility that microdosing can help them, but I also uh, don't want there to be only one way to receive that microdose. You know, I like the idea of people being able to go to therapy to be able to use these mushrooms, but I don't think having uh, the therapist is the only way to do it. Um, there's an interesting um, video that popped up on the internet probably about a month and a half ago um, that that if the tagline is true, which from the visuals that are being presented looks to be that way, um, represents a shortcoming of modern American society and a perfect opportunity for those of us in this community space to see a need that is going to a, a future need or a present need that needs fulfilling that we could show up and try to do. Okay. I know this is vague and I'm going to get into the point. Um, there was a video that was released of what looked to be an American high school teachers, like, like the front office. And the tagline was somebody dosed the water fountain with LSD. And it was a bunch of high school kids tripping their balls off. Like there are students that are doing, um, just walking around, just talking as if they're talking to somebody. There are students basically in the fetal position on the ground. There are people just dancing and doing weird stuff. It's just like, that's a possibility. That is a, that is a possibility. And that is a shortcoming of us to not have a system in place, a community response team, like what should have happened in my perfect world would have been a Zendo would have popped up immediately, just like the fire department would have come in and, and responded to a fire. Um, the Zendo would have popped up right in front of the university with, with tents and soft music and comfy places to sit. And they would have invited the students and the family to come in and parents could come in and they would take their students from that Zendo as, after talking with people about what to expect and things like that. They could take them home or they could spend time with them there. You know, it would become a pop-up community center to handle this response. You know, it's like, that's a perfect opportunity for us, those of us that know the importance of these, this, this trial and tribulation that these kids are being put through without their consent. You know, it's like, I, I just think that there's a whole space to have this conversation and be open to not just see it as the tragedy it is, but a responsibility that we can own up to. Yeah. How far away do you think we are from that, though, realistically? I think we are, if I'm going to be honest, a conservative estimate, three years away, um, a liberal estimate, I would say we could probably do something um, responsive like that in a year with the right planning. Um, yeah. I already know that the community community networks exist in the Bay, specifically to answer your question about Oakland. Like um, if it like something like that happened in Oakland. Um, yes, I think that there would be an ability for a community response team to occur. Um, but I do believe that it would take um, working on its smaller basis is first. So it's like a community response team would be just something like I said, like a, a large scale event like that versus like, one person that's having an issue in a location like you don't need a whole zendo to pop up at that point but you do need to have a comfortable space for this person to move to move out of this dangerous space into and that doesn't necessarily have to look like a whole like thing but it can definitely look like a a we're going to pop up in a, a specialty rv with like a, a pop-out tent that we're going to build into this nice little space where we're going to hang out here with you and then we're going to create this space where you can be a part of this. And it's like, it's not a legal space. It's not a, um, it's, and it's meant to be protective. You know, it's meant to be like, okay, this is a space where you can be, do what you need to do. And then once we're done, we will help you move back to where you need to be. And I think that is something that could occur in the next 
three years conservatively, maybe a year and a half with the right planning. Um, but that's again a pipe dream. I don't know if that's even. I, I know the community okay. exists. At the pace of legalization in the United States right now, I think that it's your 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 chances are much higher uh, than yes. they've ever been before. And uh, yes, um, you know, I think I, I think that we are just at the again the the, the launching point here uh, in a lot of places. And um, <clears throat> it's funny because you know I'm 60 years old and I've got friends that are 60 years old who are calling me about microdosing on a regular, you know, it's very, it's turning into it's one of the top discussions now is uh, oh wow hey, have you tried that have you tried that out before you know, interesting you know, interesting everybody, everybody starving for information want to learn more and it's you know i'm i'm sending people in in your direction say here you go the first thing you need to do is understand what you're dealing with here and uh then i think uh from there, we can we can really grow, and I'm excited. I gotta tell you, you have got me as excited about this field as as anything else. And I got two pages of notes here, which I have got to go and and, and now uh, follow up with uh, and find out. And I'm gonna put up all of the graphics here for everything that we've discussed, uh, so that everybody gets a chance to actually get a chance to see what these look like. Um, they they roll off your tongue uh, uh, so beautifully, but I have to go go. Oh shit! Now, like, how am I spelling that? Okay. Yeah, um, I know it. It's okay. overexposure. I know I make it sound so easy sometimes. Is what people say. It's like it's not that easy. Trust me. It's 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 it's, it's hours of trying to figure it out. Like I struggled with aruginacin. Hell, I even struggled with psilocybin and psilocybe for years until I was just like, fuck it. I'll just figure it out. Well. It's again, we, we, we live and we learn, and that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and sir, thank you. Blessings to you, and thank you so much for joining me again. This has been fantastic, and um, I, I'm excited. And uh, I, hopefully, if I get a chance, I want to hear about your classes as soon as your classes are open. I'm over here in Europe, but I am planning on making a trip into California, and I might plan my trip around California around when you're going to be teaching, because uh, uh, if I'm going to learn anyone, I'd like to learn it from you. I would love to make that a part of the course. Like I would love to have you learn as much as you can and take as much as you can away because again, um, having more people understand it's the most important lesson. Lorenzo Haggerty, one of my favorite psychonauts um, and curator of the Psychedelic Salon says, when it comes to psychedelics, it's no, not no. K-N-O-W, not N-O. Outstanding. Thank you, kind sir. We will uh, see you again soon. Be safe, stay healthy. <laughs> it's Captain Hooter. Far out, man.